I love you, Lord. <laughs> right? Let's pray. Father, thank you. I honor you this morning. May your word do what it is set to do. Lord, challenge us, change us, correct us, help us know you better. Lord, your word is as sharp as a two-edged sword sometimes, dividing soul and spirit, marrow and flesh. So, Father, let it penetrate our hearts this morning and let it bring us closer to you, not further from you. Lord, I remember when it was said to me that your word will keep us from sin or sin will keep us from your word. May the previous always be true. We love you. We honor you today in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to show you something real quick. See that little red dot right there? That means this is the end of my notes. One page. I normally walk up here with seven. Today's message is going to be this. <clears throat> We're in a kingdom series, right? The kingdom of God today. Um, I have, I hope that I have done a good enough job of saying that the kingdom of God here on earth is you walking in the authority of the King Jesus, right? You are a, a, a subject of the King. You are a child of the King. And so what you do here on this earth, you are ruled by God. And so that means that we, we live differently, we act differently, right? We, we think differently, we do differently than the world or than sin. Amen? Okay. If that's really the case, then I want to break it down just a little bit more. There's one thing that happens in a kingdom that does not happen in a republic. Now, we live in a republic, right? That's what the whole uh, kingdom series is about. We're in, we're in this election cycle. And again, Pastor Wes has never told you who to vote for or how to vote. I'm going to tell you, though, get out there and vote. Um, but I've never told you how to or who to. But we live in a republic, and many of us think that we actually have a say. Now, depending on the state you live in and depending on where you're watching from online, sometimes you feel like, and I'm not asking for hands or nods or laughs or anything else, but sometimes you feel like it doesn't matter how you vote, it's not going to matter anyway, right, because of the state that you live in. I think it's something like 65 or 70 percent of the votes are in the four corners of the United States, right? Seattle being one, L.A., Hollywood, California, New York, and Miami, Orlando, that whole greater area. And they're split, right? And so we live in this republic where we have the responsibility, I'm going to say it that way, as a, this is your civic responsibility to get out there and help choose what's going to happen here in the United States. It's not that way in a kingdom, you guys. In a kingdom, there is one authority. In the kingdom, there is one ruler. And guess what? That ruler is picked by whether or not they are the winner of battles and wars. Now, back in the Bible days, God would appoint a king, right? He appointed Saul. He appointed David, right? He anointed them. They became king. A lot of the other kings in the Gentile nations and a lot of the other kingdoms that were built were, I want your land. I want your stuff. I want your people. I'm going to go conquer you. Now you call me king. And what did they set up? One authority. That's what a kingdom is. And everybody has to do what to that authority? This is the hardest part of the whole message. You ready? Everybody has to do what for that authority? Obey. Or there's consequences. Obey and there's blessing but obey and there's consequences or there's consequences. And so the, the, the hard reality of us trying to understand to live in God's kingdom authority here on this earth is exactly that word, authority. Question yourself, ask yourself, who has authority in your life? Are you the only one who makes the decisions? 
Are you the only one that you turn to? Let me tell you who has authority in your life. When something goes wrong, the first person or first thing that you turn to to make sure that everything's going to be okay, that's who you've given authority to in your life. For some of us, it's not God first. Right? It's not King Jesus first. I think, Mr. Allen, that's why we have so many addictions in this world. Because we, things are not going okay. I don't want to mess with this. I want to do what I want. I'm, good, I'm trying to be the person that I want to be, right? Last week we talked about the lens of I'm a good person. It's okay. Yes, but even a good person needs to understand that they are still under authority. Just as the senior pastor of this church doesn't mean that I'm it. Thank God, because I'm a doofus sometimes. Right? We have a board here at the church. I work with the board pretty closely. I also have a mentor pastor above me who, if I need somebody, I know who to call. And, and prior to the executive director switch, I had somebody that was even above him that if I absolutely needed someone, I knew who to call. I, I still submit to and authority. And ultimately, all of us in the kingdom of God, we submit to the ultimate authority, Jesus Christ. Authority and obedience are the foundation of the kingdom of God. If you want to be considered a child of the king, then therefore you have to Obey the king. Jesus gives us a perfect picture of this in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, I'm going to read verses 5 through 13. 5 through 13, as long as my voice will hold. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pled with him, Lord, my young servant lies in bed, paralyzed, and in terrible pain, then Jesus says, I will come and heal. Pause. Jesus was willing to go and heal. He was willing to go to this person's house. This is a whole different message for a whole different day, but Jesus is ready to meet you where you are for, for your need. You just got to be willing to go to him like the Roman officer did. Why did the Roman officer go to Jesus? Watch this. The officer said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my supervisor officer and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need say go and they go or come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. Verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said this, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from the east and the west, to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and feast in the kingdom of heaven. So not here on this earth, but at the end, when we're all sitting with God, that's what he's saying. So here in the kingdom of heaven, this person understands authority, they're going to know the kingdom of heaven. Verse 12, many Israelites, however, for those who the kingdom was prepared for, they will be thrown into outer darkness where be, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, go back home because, you're, you're, because you believed it has happened and the young servant was healed that same hour. The thing that Jesus said that helps me understand that the kingdom of God's foundation is authority is he said that he has never seen faith in anyone in all of Israel. Can you realize, can you grasp how big that is? A man who understands authority has the greatest faith in all of Israel. So Jesus put such emphasis 
on the need to understand the authority in the kingdom, that in kind of half-heartedly shunned all of the Israelites and was like, you guys suck. This guy is great. Oh, and the kingdom that was prepared for you, um, because you don't understand the authority structure, you're not going to get in. Because you don't understand authority. Now, now I think a lot of our problems in this world and by world, I'm going to narrow it down, United States, and I'll narrow it down even more here in the state of Washington. And if I narrow it down anymore, I'll be in your back pocket, so I'm going to stay there. <laughs> I don't think we often have a too much of a sin problem. I think we have an authority problem. I think the reason that we sin is because we misunderstand the authority that God has. Did you know that the word mercy is not just a nice, pretty little biblical word? Mercy means that God is holding back his wrath and your punishment. And you're not getting what you deserve. I'm not getting what I deserve. That's mercy. But sometimes when we have an authority problem, then we also often have a sin problem. These reoccurring sins that we all go through, God, I don't want to. God, I'm sorry. God, I don't want to. God, I'm sorry. You guys, that's not a sin problem. It's an authority problem. You don't understand that your king says, I can free you from that, and I have freed you from that because of the work on the cross. You have to then walk in that freedom because I have the authority to give you the freedom. What did Jesus say before he took off of the earth? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So therefore, go and make disciples. Therefore, go and tell everybody that they can be free. Therefore, go and spread this authority that I have been given and let them know the kingdom of God is near. You can live in freedom today. You can live in freedom tomorrow. You don't have to sin again. I don't think it's a sin problem. I don't think it's a heart problem. Sometimes it's a heart problem. I don't think it's a sin problem. I think it's an authority problem. I think we forget that we are supposed to be subject to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so what we do is we please self instead of want to turn around and please the King. The authority structure is the foundation of the kingdom of God. If you want to be a part of the kingdom, you have to obey the king. The next part of all of this, I want to, I want to read you this, and I'm, I don't know exactly where I'm going to stop, but I'm going to start in Matthew chapter 22. And we're going to start in verse 23. And of course, the heading of this portion of Matthew 23 is this. The authority of Jesus is challenged. Right? How many times was Jesus actually like, hey, prove that you're the son of God. Hey, prove that you, are you sure? You can't do that. But then we actually get to a point where the Pharisees go, um, by whose authority do you do this? Okay, I'm gonna back up just a second. These Pharisees had their heads stuck so far in dark places that they dare challenge God incarnate. Uh, thank you. I was just going to say, me too. There are times, and I know I say it up here jokingly from time to time, but in my prayer time or in the time when I'm actually, and I say, are you sure, God? 
Why do we say that? We're scared. It's hard. I don't want to. I'm not, a, I'm not an agent of change. Me, I am. I'd love for things to change. Not my wife. She's like, nope, we're going to wait. Right? Can we paint this? Nope. How about if we move the, nope. But you know, these guys were in such narcissistic, prideful settings all the time, all day. You know, they, they knew the law. They knew the law. They followed the law. And then they walk up to the they walk up to God incarnate and they and they say this, Matthew chapter 21. When Jesus returned to the temple and he began teaching. Now, this is after Jesus turns the tables over and he's yelling at everybody and he made a whip and he's driving folks out of the temple and he says, My house is supposed to be a house of prayer. Right? He quotes that scripture. And then the Pharisees, it, seeing his anger, seeing the spiritual authority he just took, they have the audacity to walk up and say this. They demanded, by what authority are you doing all of these things? Who gave you the right? God, who gave you the right to take my child? Who gave you the right to take my job? God, who gave you the right to take my spouse? Who gave you the right? We're constantly challenging God's authority. Jesus says this, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. If you can answer me one question. Kind of sounds like God talking to Joe. Put on your big boy pants. I'm about to talk to you. Jesus replied, verse 25, did John's authority to baptize come from heaven or was it merely human? They talked it over among themselves. If we say that it was from heaven, he will ask us, then why didn't we believe John? But if we say it's merely human, we'll be mobbed because the people believe that he was a prophet. And so the best answer that they could come up with was verse 27. We don't know. So Jesus says this, then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. And then his very next breath, Jesus ties the second portion of the kingdom that I'm talking about today. He ties it into the story, verse 28. What do you think about this? The man with two sons told the older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and he went anyway. And then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which of these obeyed his father? And they replied, the first. Then Jesus explained his meaning. Then I tell you the truth. Corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him. And while tax collectors and prostitutes did, and even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sin. When we understand the authority of Jesus, we understand the importance of obedience. God doesn't tell us to do something just so that he can enjoy or be entertained by us. I think that's what he made orangutans for. They're pretty fun to watch. But when it comes to the child of the king, what he wants is obedience because he gives everything else to you. So what he wants is your obedience. Now, here's where the bold part comes in. I don't care who you vote for next week. That's not a God obedience issue. God did not tell you to vote for one or the other. What 
well, Pastor Wes, how are we supposed to? If you're listening to God, if you're listening for him, if you're listening and you understand the authority of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and you're listening for him, here's what I want you to think about for one second. What was the last thing he asked you to do that you disobeyed? What was the last thing he told you to do? Let's go back to that and start there. Because you know what I get from this story of the two sons? One said no, but he went anyway. One said yeah, but he didn't. You know what I get from this story? Delayed obedience is still disobedience. Yeah, God, sure, I'm going to do that. Now, can I be 100% transparent? Maybe you're not ready for this. You know, if we keep it 100 up here, some people might not like me at the end of the day. But let me tell you this. Your pastor is sitting in delayed obedience. I was asked to do something about three, four months ago, and I've yet to do it. And I've made excuse after excuse. I've questioned his authority multiple times. And I know it's for my betterment, and I know it's for the betterment of this church, and I know that it's for the betterment of the, the kingdom of God. I know that it's so that when the spiritual maturity book gets opened, I'm going to be there. Now, it's not something so gigantic that you're going to gasp. <gasps> I typically go away for a couple of days to fast and pray and just be with the Lord, and I've been asked to do that probably two, three months ago. Right, babe? Didn't we talk about that two, three months ago? I still haven't scheduled it. And God's ready to download something to me, and I'm like, Lord, I'm already so full. I just don't know what else to do. I, I got to take some irons out of the fire first. I'm making all of these excuses. But I think God is ready to move you forward and move this church forward. He's got to move me forward too. So see, it's not that I'm up here preaching this really hard and I'm shaming on you and I don't got no fingers pointed or none of that. Delayed obedience to the Lord is still disobedience. You ever, heard, you ever heard those parents, and I'm not bugging you or shunning you or shaming you if you are one of these, but I always hated when I heard this. One, two, you're allowing for delayed obedience, which is still disobedience. I don't think I've ever recalled God go, Wes, <clears throat> one, No, see, I grew up in a household. When you disobeyed, you got a, a belt or a paddle or whatever was in reach. Because my parents made sure that I understood that there is an authority structure. And when you understand authority, you're more prone to obey. Here's the last thing I'm going to say, and then I want to pray, and we'll get out of here. I mentioned the spiritual maturity book. And I've been struggling with this and how to say this. So let me see if it comes out right. I've been a follower of Christ for 40 years. 40 years. And I asked God one day, I said, how do I know when I can be considered spiritually mature? And I look at the room around me and I know that there's folks who have been Followers of Christ longer than I have. And I would ask you the same question, but I've already gotten an answer. And the answer is this, spiritual maturity is not based on time in, it's based on obedience to. Our spiritual maturity is not, I've followed God for 40 years. Our spiritual maturity is, I've been following God for four years, eight years, and when he says, hey, quit your job and go jump into ministry, you do. When he says, I need you to not do this anymore, you, you, you stop. That's spiritual maturity. Not the fact that you read your Bible 10, 12 hours a week. Not the fact that you pray, you know, 3, 4, 5, 8, 10, 12 times a day. 
Not the fact that you give or give to the church or give to other places. That is not spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity is he speaks, you step. He says, go, you go. Remember the Roman soldier? I tell my one, go, and he goes. I tell my other one, come, and he comes. I tell someone, do, and they do. That is what it looks like to live under the authority of God, is to then walk in the obedience of God. Amen? You guys okay? Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for our time together in this place. I can only speak for my heart, Lord, and for my life, but I'm going to say, Father, I'm sorry for the times when I have not been obedient quickly. And I knew it was going to be a test this year because That was a part of our 2024. Ask big and obey quickly. So I knew it was coming. So Father, forgive me. Forgive us for the times when we have questioned your authority. Forgive me for the times. Forgive us for the times that we have bought into delayed obedience or that we've struggled and said, but I don't want to, but I just don't understand. Or, or maybe, maybe there's someone under the sound of my voice who's like, God, if you just explain it all to me first, then I will do it. That's not how the kingdom works. Help us live in your authority, God, so that we can be children of the king, that we can live in the kingdom of God today. So one day we will be in the kingdom of heaven. So one day we will know that we were obedient to you, that we were loved by you, we were provided for by you. We thank you, Lord. It's a hard lesson to learn, but continue to teach us to live and walk in your kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my life as you see it in heaven. We honor you, we thank you, and we love you. Thank you for the provision of food today, Lord. May it be nourishing to our bodies. We ask all of this today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.